beginning live stream. I'll let you know. PC recording on the way. Backup is rolling. Recording to the cloud, all set. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Ku, we are ready to begin. Joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to acknowledge my fellow Council members who are present Council Member uh, Bavali, John Lai, Moyer, Council Member John, uh, uh, Council Member Wiley, uh, Janelle. Brooks Powers, Council Member Holden, and Council Member, I think this is it, yeah, and Council Member Cabrera, okay. Good morning, I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to welcome my fellow Council Members, members of the administrations and the public who have come to participate in today's hearing. Today, <clears throat> we will be examining the work of the Parks Department as it relates to maintaining a crucial element of our environment trees. The benefits of well-maintained trees are obvious. They improve water quality, by filtrating and diverting stormwater runoff. Increase property values, filter high frequency noises, provide habitats for wildlife, mitigate the heat island effect, and provide better air quality by reducing the presence of many air pollutants. It has been estimated that the city trees reduce annual residential energy costs by $17 million per year and reduce one off by 69 million, 69 million cubic feet per year. These benefits are estimated to have a total value of about $100 million each year. The process involved in maintain has many facets, which the department will speak about in more detail when it presents its testimony. Briefly, the process includes a block by block pruning schedule, engaging nonprofits to help plan, preserve, and protect trees, and an inspection process through the park in inspection program or PIP, in which inspections are carried out annually in parks and playgrounds. Over the recent years, the department's budget for maintenance has suffered ups and downs as the pulling cycle had to be increased from once every seven years to once every 15 years and back once again to seven years. But with recent budgets, some of those funds have been restored. But issues still persist. For example, the top categories, top categories of parks related 311 calls involve complaints about trees. Some of these complaints 
which include concerns over premature deaths to new trees, broken tree limbs, and sidewalk trees, uh, sidewalk damage resulting from growing tree roots. Additionally, falling tree branches, many from trees that have been weakened due to severe weather, have raised severe serious concerns. And there have been numerous incidents over the years where severe injury and even death to innocent bystanders resulting from being struck. This will be a major problem that needs to be addressed as climate change is going to leave the city more vulnerable to more severe weather and storms. And city trees and benefits we, we, we derive from them will increasingly be at risk if we don't maintain them in a smart way. My office, my office continuously receives numerous complaints from owners and residents about tree complaints. they submitted to the city, only for nothing to be done. So no one is surprised when tree goes down a couple years later. My council members echo, many council members echo these same complaints. During our hurricane, Isaiah's hearing last year. So I hope we can at least make the process for addressing complaints more efficient. This also to highlight how critical proper tree maintenance is to the quality of life and to the safety of all who live and visit this city. The committee today will also consider seven pieces of legislation sponsored by my colleagues and myself. Proposed intro 98A, sponsored by myself, aims to remove the hazards from sidewalks and improve the aesthetic of city neighborhoods by requiring the commissioner of DPR to replace trees and vegetation in anti tree pits. Related to this bill, I'm happy to be partnering with NYC Parks now to do a pilot program of installing permeable pavement and tree pits. This is in response to tree pits being compacted due to normal, due to level sidewalks, which turns them into tripping hazards and also results in being unhealthy for trees. Our pilot will help to keep our pedestrian and sidewalk safe, keep our trees safe with room to grow and to help better catch storm water. We will also hear intro 199, sponsored by council member Matthew, a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to the undertaking of surveys before planting trees. Intro 467, sponsored by Council Member Drum, a local law to amend, to amend the administrative code in relation to requests for trees. Intro 552, sponsored by Council Member Levine, a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to posting of information online regarding tree stone removal. Intro 957, sponsored by Council Member Borali, a local law to amend, to amend the administrative code in relation to replacement of city-owned trees that have been lawfully removed. And sponsored by myself, Intro 2365, a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to the creation of a Dan Tree Task Force to coordinate the removal of fallen trees due to a severe 
weather event. And finally, in two, three, six, six, a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to requiring tree health assessments and inspections. I would like to thank all of my colleagues for sponsoring these bills. It's my hope that this hearing will set the stage for this council and the administration to work together to better recognize the need to fully allocate all necessary resources for the care of city trees. Finally, I would like to note that this past Friday, Mayor DeVasio appointed Gabriel Fialkov as the new commissioner of Parks Department. I would like to congratulate her on the appointment and I look forward to meeting with her very soon and working with her through the rest of the year. Thank you again and welcome. I would like to ask Council Member Trump to make a statement uh, for his bill. Thank you very much, Chair Ku. And I really appreciate you holding this hearing on trees today. Trees are certainly beautiful, but they also have a myriad of benefits to the health of our city and its inhabitants. Unfortunately, our urban tree canopy is under attack. And I don't just mean by the latest invasive insect species. Trees must contend with a host of challenges, not only overdevelopment and vandals, but also poor planning and a lack of vision at the highest levels. It seems our urban foresters, human stewards, have utterly failed it. The title of this hearing draws attention to the sad reality that New York lags far behind other cities. While we are concerned about maintaining the tree stock, others have prioritized increasing the overall number of trees as part of their green infrastructure plans. Washington DC's canopy has grown tremendously in recent years and at 38% is well on its way to reaching its 40% goal by 2032. New York stands at a paltry 22%. Reaching 30% by 2035 is an attainable goal, but it requires a shift in our mentality from defense to offense. A broad coalition of stakeholders agrees, and even before its release, I have been working to advance the goals of the ambitious New York City Urban Forest Agenda. Intro 1749, the New York City Tree Canopy Protection Act and several other bills that tackle the issue from a systemic perspective are not being heard today. But fortunately, as an interim measure, intro 467, which is being heard today, aims to address the lack of transparency at the Department of Parks and Recreation around requests for planting of street trees. It is commendable that so many New Yorkers request the planting and replanting of street trees. However, at least in the environmental justice community I represent, a small fraction of these trees are actually planted. The absurd response that I have most often heard is that utility lines run under the empty tree pits. These pits once hosted trees so that it is hard to imagine that nothing could be planted there. And I wonder, are we taking Con Ed over trees or what the story is with that? The impact of this bureaucratic intransience is row after stock row of empty tree pits where tree line blocks once existed. I know that my district is not the only one undergoing this horrifying deforestation. I am fortunate enough to have some fierce tree advocates in my district, some of whom are here today, people like Len Maniachi from the Jackson Heights Beautification Group and the Friends of Travis Park, and I thank them for their tireless efforts on behalf of one of our city's most valuable natural resources. Thank you for being here and thank you Chair Ku for holding this important hearing. Thank you, Council Member Drum. I uh, would like to 
to acknowledge uh, Council Member Rivera also joined this hearing. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council Chris Satori, to go over some procedural procedural uh, items. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel of the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We'll first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public who have registered to testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including the time it takes to answer such questions. For members of the public, we'll be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who have uh, come here to testify. Once you are called on to speak, please begin by stating your name and the organization you, re you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the Parks Department to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Parks and Recreation will be First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh, Assistant Commissioner for Forestry, Horticulture and Natural Resources, Jennifer Greenfeld, and Director of Government Relations, Matt Jury. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? First, Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Greenfeld. Yes, I do. And Director Drury? I do. Thank you. At this time, I will invite First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh to present his testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee, and other members of the City Council. I am Liam Kavanaugh, First Deputy Commissioner for New York City Parks. I'm pleased to be joined today by Jennifer Greenfeld, Assistant Commissioner for Forestry, Horticulture, and Natural Resources as well as our Director of Governmental Relations, Matt Drury. I wanna start by noting our appreciation for the Council's continued advocacy for city parks, and especially for the resources and support it has provided to our forestry, our forestry efforts. New York City's tree canopy is an incredible natural resource that delivers environmental and economic benefits to New Yorkers. Nearly $260 million worth in combined annual and accumulated value which has become all the more important in the face of global, global climate change. Our agency manages over 50% of the city's tree canopy, which represents the best possible opportunity to maximize the benefits of this vital resiliency infrastructure in hopes of staving off the worst impacts of climate change. Our city trees capture stormwater, help mitigate carbon emissions and pollution, increase property values, and provide invaluable shade to keep our neighborhoods cooler. We have invested significantly in planting for new trees along city streets, as well as throughout our parks and forests. Through the Cool Neighborhoods Initiative, we're focused on parts of the city that have been traditionally underserved and overlooked to ensure that trees are being planted in the neighborhoods that are the most vulnerable to heat impacts. In addition to planting new trees, protecting and caring for existing trees is critical to maintaining and expanding our urban tree canopy. This administration has provided consistently high levels of funding for routine street tree pruning and maintenance, and has significantly convinced the level of annual funding provided for block pruning in comparison to previous administrations. Our highly trained and dedicated forestry staff work closely with our contractors and other service providers to address tree concerns as quickly as possible, utilizing a risk management approach that prioritizes the conditions that present the most risk to the safety of New Yorkers. Over time, our standards and protocols towards tree planting and tree care have evolved, informed by closely tracking research and best practices implemented by urban foresters around the world. 
I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the excellent work done by our forestry staff. If you've enjoyed a picnic under a park tree, taking a moment to enjoy the cool air along a tree-lined block, or taking a peaceful walk in the woods, you have them to thank. The trees along our streets, throughout our park landscapes, and clustered in our natural forests are living network of vital New York City infrastructure that helps keep our city healthy, safe, and vibrant. Just like the city's networks of street lamps or water mains, our urban tree canopy is a vital asset that needs to be maintained, protected, and preserved. As we all have come to recognize the global climate change emergency is all too real, and our city's tree canopy is the first line of defense. To that end, we take our responsibility very seriously to prevent tree impacts from nearby construction or other work, and we do everything in our power to ensure that the removal of a healthy tree is to be avoided if at all possible. The seven separate pieces of legislation being hear, heard today touch upon a very wide range of forestry related topics. Intro 98 relates to untran, un, unplantable street tree beds. Intro 199 regards the undertaking of surveys for planting street trees. Intro 467 would compel increased reporting related to public requests for tree plantings. Intro 552 relates to the posting of information online regarding tree stump removal. Intro 7957 would impact the replacement of city-owned trees after their lawful removal. Intro 2365 relates to the city's down tree task force. And intro 2366 regards tree health assessments and inspections in advance of pruning maintenance. Regarding the legislation being heard today, we appreciate the intent of these bills and are happy to work closely with the council to discuss paths forward to addressing any existing concerns regarding our city's tree canopy. Given the expansive breadth of these issues our limited and our limited time today won't allow for us to provide a comprehensive overview of all of our agency's forestry management efforts, but we are always available to provide further information about our tree related programs and practices in hopes of helping you and your constituents better understand our forestry work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for the chance to listen to testimony from the public on this topic through the council's hearing live stream. We are now happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. And I will now turn it back to Chair Ku for questions. The member of the bean, uh, whether he. Uh, go okay, ahead, Chair. Now, again, yeah. Okay, so we are also joined by Council Member Levine and Brandon. Commissioners, thank you for coming to testify. Uh, my first question is, is, I want to hear about the overall tree inspection process. Are trees in parks routinely inspected as part of the park inspection program, PIP? Yes, Council Member Ku, uh, trees are one of the elements that are assessed by the inspectors during the park inspection program, uh, semi-annual visits. In addition to that, our park supervisors who conduct monthly written evaluations of all of the parks they're responsible for, consider, look at the trees as well as part of that uh, process. Uh, they refer any conditions uh, that are of concern to them to the borough forestry office for additional inspection as, does, as is the case with the park inspection program inspections. So we do have a system for assessing trees. These are not inspections conducted by trained arborists. I just wanna be clear about that, uh, but they are uh, uh, evaluations of trees uh, that do inform our decisions about tree maintenance within parks. Thank you. So how are 311 complaints uh, regarding trees uh, treated? If a tree was just pruned two years ago, does the complaint have to wait it, have to wait until the next pruning cycle to be addressed? 
In some cases, yes, council member. Uh, you know, we, we prune approximately 70,000 street trees or more a year. Uh, and it is the sort of the basis uh, of our maintenance approach to the urban forest. Uh, trees, according to industry standards, should be pruned on a five to seven year cycle. Uh, and thankfully, because of the funding that we received during this administration, we've been able to attain that, that level of care with the exception of FY21 when the pandemic uh, eliminated uh, much of our funding for uh, maintenance and other activities that we typically perform. Uh, we will, if a tree poses uh, a problem uh, or if there's something potentially hazardous with the tree, of course, we'll inspect it. Uh, but if there is a request for routine pruning uh, subsequent to the most recent pruning, we will wait until the next pruning cycle in order to address the tree. So uh, is there currently a backlog of tree complaints that need to be addressed? And how are trees uh, issues weighted in terms of what gets prioritized? Jasmine, we receive uh, many service requests, as I referred to, uh, from the public every year concerning, concerning tree conditions. Uh, in a typical year, it's, it's between 70 and 80,000. And in a year in which we have uh, large numbers of storms, it can easily exceed 100,000 and, and reach over 120,000 service requests. Normal service requests, they come to us through several means, primarily through 311, calling directly to 311. 311 online, uh, the parks website, and the New York City tree map. All of those methods uh, allow the public to create a service request asking anything about a tree. Uh, they all feed directly into our forestry management system, uh, and they all create an individual record for every service request that we receive. We prioritize the service request inspections based on the condition that is described to us by the public. So any condition that appears as if it may indicate a tree in poor condition or a tree that, uh, that presents a potential hazard, uh, we prioritize, prioritize inspecting those service requests, uh, of course, uh, and we apply uh, a tree risk management approach to evaluating the conditions that are brought to our attention. Our Inspectors are certified arborists. Uh, we have about 80 throughout the entire system who are certified arborists, and about 50 of those arborists are further certified as tree risk assessment qualified inspectors. It is a special credential developed by the International Society of Arboriculture uh, that trains them to identify risk uh, in trees uh, based on the condition of the tree and the location of the tree. Uh, they apply that training and knowledge to those inspections. Uh, they assign what we call a risk rating uh, to that inspection or to that tree. And our responses are based on the results of those risk inspections. The highest rated risk, uh, obviously, is the work that we do first and do as quickly as possible. Uh, and we work down the scale, uh, you know, from the highest to lower risk categories. Uh, and that, that's really the basis of, of, of what our approach to managing the forest when it comes to public service requests. Of course, we do have an extensive block pruning program that uh, is sort of the cornerstone of our maintenance uh, approach to the urban forest. Uh, but I hope that answers the question that you had, Council Member. Okay. Yes, uh, so, so how often is tree maintenance work done in-house versus by contractors? The, the, the vast majority of the tree work that's done on an annual basis is done by contracts, primarily through the block pruning program and through our stump removal contracts. Uh, between them, they probably address between 70, thousand and eighty five thousand either trees pruned stumps removed in the course of the year um, in the parks staff which folk which focuses primarily on risk high risk uh, situations that are outside of the block pruning program uh, we remove 
anywhere between 8,000 and 12,000 trees in the course of a, of a typical fiscal year. Uh, we address 10,000 emergency situations in the course of a typical year. Uh, they also prune trees that uh, need to be addressed outside of the block pruning program. And, and that varies from year to year, depending on a number of factors. Uh, uh, how many of those uh, 70,000 to 80,000 complaints are addressed each year? Uh, are there any that came over to the next year? I'm sorry, Council Member. I, it is not as if the, the block pruning program does not address, uh, directly address 70,000 service requests that we receive in a year. The block pruning program are geographically grouped trees uh, to maximize both productivity and to minimize cost and to uh, establish a pattern of, of maintenance across the city that's reliable uh, and that allows us to know that we have treated different you know, areas in a systematic fashion, but it does not uh, directly address the service requests that we receive. Some of them, yes, uh, but it is not a one-for-one -one, uh, um, sort of correlation between service requests and trees pruned under the block pruning program. Um, council member, if I could just add a couple of um, notes, thank you for your questions. Um, this is Commissioner uh, Greenfeld here. Um, I do wanna give you a little bit of a sense of the scale of inspections that we do. These um, very highly trained professionals uh, in FY20, which is our last sort of benchmark of a typical year, um, inspected 130,000 of our trees. That's, you know, uh, nearly 20% of our population. It's a significant number. And that's both proactive inspections. So we're ahead of the game and inspections in response to the service requests that we receive. And we can get you that answer uh, later about how what we receive uh, rates to, you know, relates to what we, um, what we inspect each year. Remember inspections. Um, so thank you. Okay. So uh, so what exactly happens when pruning cycles are extended beyond the recommended seven years? Uh, how does pass catch up? Well, it's only happened once in the last 20 year, 15 years, and that was last year during COVID. Um, so we've been really fortunate, uh, particularly in this administration, to have maintained our very you know, um, industry standard seven year pruning cycle. Uh, so what we did was we essentially, um, last year with a small number, we were able to finish off what we couldn't finish in FY20. Um, and then we're just starting uh, with the next round of uh, communities that are ready to get their block pruning um, this fiscal year. So it's a seven year cycle, we track, each community board gets a portion of their trees pruned every year, and we just went right back on track in FY22. Uh, how much pruning is done in-house uh, versus uh, via contractors? Council member, it varies from year to year, but we have two approaches to pruning in-house. Uh, our horticulture staff prunes approximately 10,000 young street trees every year. We think it's an important uh, foundational maintenance uh, tactic uh, that helps the tree get established properly. Uh, and we think we'll avoid problems in the future when they grow. And our climbers and pruners, these are our tree workers. Uh, again, it varies from year to year, but they, they can prune anywhere from four to 6,000 trees in the course of a year. Uh, I want to go back to uh, the last question I asked you, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. What requirements and qualifications apply to tree maintenance contractors? For example, are they required to be certified arborists? They are required to have certified arborists supervising their work. Uh, that, is, that is one of the requirements. And they are required to adhere to national standards when it comes to tree pruning. These are standards established throughout the industry. And uh, about how many contractors does 
Thus, uh, DPR work, uh, 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 the tree maintenance work. Um, Commissioner Greenfeld, do you happen to know how many contractors we have working for us right now? For the um, tree maintenance. For right, tree for tree maintenance. Not offhand, I would imagine it's about five to 10 different ones, but we have about a dozen total. Okay. Thank you. So I also uh, want to say that uh, we are also joined by council member Ram Bremer and council member Diaz. So uh, commissioners, uh, my next question is, what exactly happens, no, this question I asked already. <laughs> Has your department looked into planting of salt water resistant trees that would survive flooding from a hurricane or other severe weather events? Um, I, I can take that. I Yes, indeed. In fact, we had a one forester very much do a research um, uh, on the best uh, sort of climate adapted coastal species. We have a new flood map that all of our surveyors use when they go out. So they know, even if there isn't flooding at the time, they know the vulnerability of that area and they select the species appropriately. What other sustainable practices uh, does the administration support uh, to better protect the trees, uh, to, to better protect the city tree stock as more severe storms are likely in the future due to climate change? I, um, I would suggest two things. I'm sure the commissioner might have another one. Uh, first of all, we want to give our newest trees the best possible chance of survival. So we make large tree beds. We select a species that's very well adapted to that site and anticipating, as we said, future climate change. The other hallmark of any resilient program anywhere, whether or not, is diversity. And we really pride ourselves on diversifying the species of the of the urban forest. We have full control over the trees that we buy for our tree planting contracts um, with uh, long term contracts with nurseries who grow the trees that are best for us and really help provide a diversity of species you won't find in most other urban forests. Um, in addition, huh. sorry, to our new tree planting, it's also our maintenance. Our proactive maintenance is a, is a major factor in improving and continuing the resiliency of our urban forest. Mm, thank you. Uh, how does parks manage trees within parks and natural areas? Uh, many of these parks have historic structures inside them. Are those taken into consideration? Uh, Yes, uh, we, um, we manage trees on streets and in parks as individual trees, individual assets. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, they are an element that is assessed in the park inspection program and in the monthly inspections conducted by park supervisors. Our foresters apply the same tree, tree risk management approach to park trees, trees in landscape parks as we as we tend to call them, uh, as they do to the streets. So if there is a, uh, a hazardous condition uh, that, uh, that requires uh, you know, more immediate attention, whether it's in a park or in a street, it will be treated the same way. Forests, however, are different. Uh, we don't manage forests as individual tree specimens. They're managed as a resource, uh, and there is a, a, a sort of a different uh, maintenance and management regime applied to forest as opposed to trees in parks and playgrounds or landscape parks as we refer to them or trees on streets. The, we're really fortunate to have worked with our nonprofit partner, the Natural Areas Conservancy to develop a, a management framework for those um, seven plus thousand acres of forested um, land in our parks. Um, it's a huge, huge important resource for us. And the council has extended funding over the last two years through the Play Fair campaign to help fund the uh, implementation of this forest management framework. 
And so we do have a really well informed and qualified staff of people uh, studying and managing uh, the forested areas. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so oftentimes after storms, we will see fallen large branches on sidewalks. Does NYC parks drive around after the storm to see if there are damaged leftover trees that need to be taken away? Uh, we do when necessary, council member. Uh, we rely primarily on the service requests uh, the public telling us where the problems occur. Uh, and that primarily drives our response, both in terms of inspection uh, and actual tree work, uh, cutting up a tree, removing it from the street. Uh, we do uh, you know, survey blocks and neighborhoods uh, at the end of storms to make sure we haven't missed anything. But the primary driver, of course, is those service requests. It's, it's really essential that the public lets us know where the problems occur. Uh, and thankfully they do for the most part. Uh, in a big storm, you can always find something that was not reported, uh, but we will come across it uh, either while we're out doing our inspections or our work or in our subsequent reviews of these neighborhoods that have been severely damaged at the conclusion of a storm. So does uh, sanitation notify you uh, of uh, some trees uh, branches on the sidewalks or uh, they ask you to uh, for your assistance to remove them? Well, it's, all, it's sort of the opposite. Uh, yes, if there is a tree that has a tree emergency that has not been addressed, that has not been cut up uh, by the Parks Department or other members of the Down Tree Task Force, including sanitation, they can refer it to us so that it is cut up. But sanitation does a great job in helping us remove tree debris from the streets during major storms. Uh, they're a member of the Down Tree Task Force. Uh, they mobilize their staff and equipment uh, to help us remove debris from the streets as quickly as possible. Thank you. What is the process for addressing an empty tree pit? Uh, if a tree pit is deemed to no longer suitable for a tree, does PASS allow other items to be planted there? Um, we, uh, we encourage, uh, you know, people to do creative things with their tree beds uh, that keep them uh, attractive, uh, discourage people from misusing them, uh, and add to the, uh, to the color and life of a neighborhood. So yes, we do encourage people to do that. Ideally, we would like to replant any uh, empty tree beds. Uh, but you know that also always becomes a question of, of, of funding to address you know the variety of uh, of goals that we've established for replanting throughout the city. Okay, so how long the public has to wait uh, before they can plan something on their own? We we don't restrict. Um planting in empty tree beds or regulate oh. that. The only thing we regulate and permit is our tree plantings or the planting of trees. Uh, okay, so thank you. Yeah, aside from the spotted lantern fly, uh, are there other inv new invasive species affecting the New York City trees? that we need to be aware of? Um, I think our, our most uh, significant concern at this point is the emerald ash borer. Um, but however, the um, mayor and city council have funded a, a really uh, um, robust program to manage for the emerald ash borer. It uh, only is affecting ash trees, which are a very small percentage of our street and park population. And we have a robust program to inspect them, remove them when they are um, uh, declining, but also treat those that are savable because we still want to have ash in our population. Even though it's a small amount, we still want to keep them. So we have a treatment program and a removal and replacement program for ashes that are impacted by the EAB, the emerald ash borer. So there's no other species? 
so what is DPR doing to combat uh, this uh, invasive species and limit tree damage? For EAB or, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Chair? Cool. Yeah, for like, recently, I, I read in the news, this uh, land, lantern fly, right? Uh, uh, like affecting our trees. Sure. So, uh, are you guys doing anything to combat them? Well, the spot, just to um, clarify, the spotted lantern fly really it, it happens to be an, a great nuisance, but it's not a threat to our trees, to the urban forest in New York City. Uh, it requires the ailanthus tree to live, um, and that's not a tree that we plant or um, sort of encourage. Uh, we, it, it's really a threat to agricultural products, uh, so it's certainly something the New York State is concerned about and looking at how to manage so it doesn't impact the state economically, but from a tree health or a um, hazard or public safety perspective, it's not a major concern. So we aren't embarking on any particular control approach. There aren't really proven affordable treatments. Um, it's not targeting a specific species like the ash. It shouldn't cause any, again, like tree failures or public safety issues. So uh, that's sort of, that's, that's been our approach. It, we, our work okay. is guided by public safety and urban forest health. Okay, thanks. Can you say a little more, a little more about the le legislation uh, being heard today? Because I didn't hear too much about that. No. Uh, the legislation in general, or a particular piece of legislation, Council Member? Yeah, in general, and in particular, which one you oppose, which one you you want to uh, you supporting? Uh... Well, they, they, you know, there are. Um, there are things I think that are valuable in, in, in almost all of the legislation. Um, and uh, it's something that we would like to work with the council to sort of try to come up with, the, with, with a comprehensive approach that addresses the concerns that the legislation uh, you know, obviously was, was, was brought forward from, uh, but in a way that uh, you know, uh, sort of helps us communicate more effectively with the public about the work we do uh, and how it impacts their lives, uh, and to uh, sort of think about you know the future and how we are managing this resource, especially in the face of, of, of a continuing climate change and the impacts it's likely to have on the city. So yes, there are there are some things that we clearly see are beneficial in the legislation, and we'd like to work with the council to shape it into a into a final product that you know serves all of our needs. Okay, I want to ask one more question and then I will turn over to uh, other members to ask questions. So if a, uh, a general public wants to call in about a damaged tree, how does he or she identify the tree? And is there any uh, uh, stickers uh, on the tree that they can identify? So instead of telling, if they are walking in the park, right, there's a tree uh, needs to be assessed or uh, it's really the trees, uh, the limb is going to fall down. Uh, they want to call 311. So is there any ID uh, on the tree that the public can use uh, to call in for information? Well, uh, most people, when they call about a street tree, they use the nearest street address, which works very well. Uh, but we do have something online called the New York City Tree Map, uh, which allows member of the public to identify the specific tree. Uh, it's geolocated on, on our map, uh, the specific tree that they are concerned about and bring that directly to our attention. Uh, we have also geolocated all of the trees in our parks, the, again, the landscape parks, not the forests, uh, which we will be adding to the tree map so that someone could, again, on their smartphone, uh, go to the tree map, identify the specific tree uh, that they're concerned about uh, and let us know almost instantly which tree it is that they want us to inspect. Uh, right now, uh, you know, if, if since the, the park trees are not available on the tree map, uh, you know, you can describe it, its location as best as possible. We'll find it. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we, we do, we're used to that. 
but again, on the streets, the address or the tree map, the street tree map will get us to the right place. So why not? There's no like ID number on this tree. No, there, there isn't a, a, uh, a barcode or uh, something like that on the tree. Uh, okay, um, right now I'm gonna turn uh, over to other uh, council members to ask questions. Uh, our moderator, uh, Chris, do we have any uh, other members who want to ask questions? Yes, thank you, Chair Koo. Um, as the Chair said, I will now call on other members to ask questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. And also please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I've called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before proceeding with your questions. We will first hear questions from Council Member Levine, followed by Council Members Holden, Rivera, and Drum. Time starts now. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chair Ku, for holding this hearing on what is just an incredibly timely topic. I think we've all seen in spectacular and painful fashion just how urgent it is that we use our urban can canopy to advance uh, protections against climate change and, and to pursue many other benefits uh, as uh, Council Member Drum so uh, eloquently uh, expressed in his opening statement. And as I think um, uh, Liam, you and your colleagues have also acknowledged as well. Uh, I, I will say I was surprised to hear very little comment on the bills uh, so far from you all. Uh, including my own, uh, which adds to the data available to the public, uh, in this case, uh, related to tree stump removal. Uh, so I, I just want to give you a chance to say again, uh, Liam, do you have specific objections to any of the bills that are currently being considered today? Um, there, we have some concerns about some elements of some of the bills. Um, you know, but for example, the proposal about additional da data on stump removal, uh, we think, you know, having access to information is important. It's important at all levels. Thanks to the council's leadership, we did create the tree work hub, uh, which lets the public see when we are uh, planning to do either contract work or work that we're, uh, that we're scheduled to do. And I think that was a, a real advance forward. Uh, this particular addition, while no objection to it per se, uh, it is the uh, sort of the, an example of where, you know, perhaps if we uh, work together, we might be able to come up with a, a, a more comprehensive approach to uh, keeping the public aware of, of the work that we're doing, the work that we're planned to do, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it. Um, so I, I see it as an opportunity uh, as much as, uh, you know, as, as beyond just the, you know, the, the language in the, in the legislation as presented. Uh, to have a, a more sort of rich conversation with both the elected officials and, uh, and the public in general about the work we do to maintain the urban forest. Well, we, we have a really good package of bills today. I'm excited about all of them. I'm particularly interested in, in Councilmember Drum's bill. I know he's going to ask questions. I'll let him follow up, but uh, we, we, we want to make these happen. Um, on the tree stumps, uh, how big is the backlog now? Uh, well, it, it's substantial. It's probably in the neighborhood of 17,000 stumps. Uh, you know, we have removed over 48,000 stumps since our uh, street tree, last street tree census in 2016, uh, but we remove between eight and 12,000 trees on an annual basis. So it's, it's a difficult uh, problem to get ahead of, let me put it that way. The other problem, well, it's not a, necessarily a problem, uh, is that it's a good thing uh, stumps have a way of disappearing at times. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't ask questions uh, in those situations, uh, but we do have a backlog of about between 17 and 18,000, I would say right now. Uh, we plan over the course of the winter when uh, time allows is to do a more in-depth review of our backlog to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. Uh, but that seems to be a, a pretty solid number based on uh, the work we've done over the years and the, and the stumps that we've generated over the years. Right. And, and I, I want to remind folks that you know, tree stump removal, first off, it's an aesthetic issue. It can be a safety issue, but 
from my perspective, it's most important because I want an actual living tree in that tree pit and you got to get the stump out before you can plant a tree. So there's a lot of reasons why it has to be done. Uh, so, so if I were to call in a tree stump today, what could I expect to be the wait time for it to be removed? Well, if it came in today, chances are we've we've already been working on our contracts for this year. It probably would not make it in there because we're not going to be able to remove all of the 17,000 stumps that we uh, that are in our backlog right now. Um, so chances are you might wait two years at least, maybe even a little bit more. Right. I mean, that's obviously an unacceptably long wait. Uh, is this a resource question? Can I just add one thing to clarify that a stump will never keep us from planting a tree? It's not a barrier. When, we, when we're ready to plant a tree, it doesn't matter whether there's a stump there or not, we take care of the stump. Well, but you have to, don't, don't you have to remove the stump to plant the tree? Oh, yeah. Yes, right. but a stump sitting there doesn't mean we won't plant the tree. It's all part of the tree planting process. We'll always remove a stump when we plant a tree. It doesn't keep us from planting a tree. So can I short circuit it? I can just request a new tree and you will take the stump right out? Oh, yeah, request a new tree. So then I can beat the two-year wait time? No, you yeah, will not be. You will not beat the two-year wait time. Unfortunately. Okay. Well, you're not, you're not helping. Helping. Council, council member, we would like nothing more to replace every tree uh, that's removed where it's where it's feasible. Not every spot is feasible for a new tree. Unfortunately, uh, we would like that very much. Uh, it, but it's a question of scale. Uh, we remove between eight and twelve thousand trees on an annual basis, even at the lower end. Uh, if it was eight thousand trees that we could replace on an annual basis at, at current cost. Uh, that's in the neighborhood of $30 million a year um, in planting costs, which would also remove the stump uh, because we can remove stumps through the tree planting process. We do it all of the time, uh, but the stump removal contracts that are usually the focus of our discussions, they are expense contracts that are targeted solely to remove stumps to eliminate the trip hazard and the unsightly conditions that they create on, on streets and sidewalks. Right, look, a stump is doing nothing to clean the air, to provide shade, to uh, cool the urban heat island, to uh, absorb greenhouse gases. So I see this as part of the broader imperative of expanding our urban forest. And, uh, and as I said earlier, uh, I believe that this cause is more urgent than ever after what we experienced over the summer. Um, uh, and I, I know my time is up, but what, what, so did you say that the resources needed to, uh, to, to catch up on the backlog and to remove stumps in a timely manner is about $30 million a year? That, that's, no, that, about, that's for tree planting, not, not yeah. stump removal. So which is a stump is much less expensive than the tree. But if you want the tree planted, we'll request the tree. And that's the, that's the funding that the commissioner was referencing. But to the extent this is a resource question, how much, are, how much do you need to fix this? Uh, Council member, I wouldn't uh, want to throw out a number. Uh, during a conversation like this, I'd be happy to, uh, to go into it in more detail and, and to really look at all of the elements that would go into a comprehensive approach to answering your question. OK. Uh, I'm going to pause there. Thank you both. Uh, I, I want to hear from my colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Ku. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris, I want to ask a question before uh, the other members. Uh, so, Commissioners, is it common to lose and remove 8,000 to 12,000 trees every year? Yes, that is our, that is our experience. Yeah? Yes. Every year you, you remove 8,000 to 12,000 trees. Wow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So Thank next you. council member, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jerko. Uh, the next council member questions is council member Holden, who's followed by council members Rivera, Drum, and Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is a very, very important uh, hearing on trees. Uh, as someone who's been um, involved in um, requesting trees for my district as a civic leader, as a community board member for well over 30 years, uh, I've never seen it this bad in the city of New York as far as any commissioner, any tree service uh, that we do uh, from parks. Let, let me go over the list. I can't get new trees in my district, even though I fund them. 
I can't get many pruned. I forget about stump removal. I'm waiting three years for my little, I have a very small stump in front of my house and I can't get that removed. And I brought this to your attention three years ago. I can't get a tree planted. I can't get any service. I can't get sidewalks fixed after storms. This is, um, this to, to, for you to say two years to get a, a stump removed, <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take that tomorrow if you, but I can't, I've been, we've had people waiting for larger stumps a decade and I can show you, I'll take you around and show you. So what, I, what the stuff I'm hearing today is either this is not for my district or there's a bunch of lies going on here. I can't get, I've been at a high school and in, in, it's not even in my district, uh, McClancy High School. I think uh, Danny, you know, Danny Trump knows where that is. Um, we can't get, there's, there's street trees on there that are hanging over the tra running track. Uh, that means the trees hanging where the, the kids are running into the trees. Now, during the summer, this was June, July, we notified parks because the president is a, is a constituent, the president of the schools in, in, in my district. We can't get, I can't get answers. I just had tried to get the answers from Queens Parks today. Nothing's getting done. Tree plantings are at all time high. What's, Commissioner, just give me a, an update on the cost of one single tree planting in the city of New York. The average contract cost to plant a tree in the city of New York is $3,400. And that needs to be investigated because that, because let me, let me just go over a couple of things. And uh, I, I'd like your, your input, Commissioner, because you were here in parks when this was happening. We used to brick over, and in fact, in front of my house, the reason why the tree died, a beautiful tree, is because parks put down sort of like cobblestones and, and brick the hole where very little water can get, get through. And these, are, these were from experts planting trees. And for $3,400, I know that you've changed it a bit. But how many thousands of trees were compromised to help because parks did not do their homework and planted and put bricks all around where there should have been dirt uh, or chips or something that could absorb water. And that's throughout the city of New York. We still have them. So there's so much catch up to do here because parks for, for decades have planted trees the wrong way. And you can see them, they're not growing, they're not flourishing. They look like, I mean, some of them look like, um, I mean, it's just, they're just uh, sticks sticking up and, and they're really very few, few, few leaves. They're in horrible, horrible condition. And I got them throughout my district. In fact, we're, I'm gonna have my staff document this because this is an absolute joke. What I'm hearing today is an absolute joke on how we're taking care of street trees in the city of New York. You can look at, go, go throughout my district and you can see them. They're unsightly, they're unhealthy, and parks, to say that parks is pruning on a regular basis, to me, that, and again, I like, prove, prove the numbers in my district. Because I, I can look at other districts, but I'm not getting trees planted. I'm not getting stumps removed. So we need a comprehensive um, accounting as to where this money, and for $3,400, are we getting the bang for our buck? I know we're not, we're making the tree beds larger and it took us decades to figure that one out. But Commissioner Kavanaugh, you were here when we were doing this. You were here when we were planting and bricking it in. Um, whose bright idea was that? I mean, I'm not an arborist, but I could figure out that if you don't allow tree, a, a lot of water for that tree, the trees, the trees, tree roots are gonna travel where the water is. So if you're watering your garden 15 feet away and you're not watering the tree, the tree roots are going to go onto your sidewalk, pick up your sidewalk and go toward your garden. Time expired. So uh, what, we, what we need is a real, comp, not just talk. We need bang for the buck. If you need additional money, budget time, let us know. Street, you know, I put in for uh, uh, stump removal, I put in for tree plantings, I put in pruning and I'm not seeing it. Not seeing it. Okay, council member, uh, you know you raise a, a lot of important issues, and uh, I, 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 I know I won't be able to answer all of them in this forum. However, I am 
more than willing to come out, meet with you and your staff, have you show me the conditions that are causing you know, your concerns and frustration uh, and give us an opportunity to perhaps explain a little bit more about what we do and how we approach it. The, the, uh, the, the problem you cite, the, the, the Belgian blocks and tree beds, that was a standard that the Parks Department used for decades. It was changed uh, over 10 years ago to eliminate that as we, as we redid our tree planting specifications. Uh, we don't do that anymore. As you noted, we do enlarge the tree beds substantially uh, to give, them, give the trees a better chance of surviving, which is in a difficult environment. Uh, I do think uh, that our program is sound and it does deliver, uh, but clearly you're not seeing it. And I would relish the opportunity uh, to explain it to you right, more detail, just, uh, specifically just, uh, as it applies to your district. All right, just, uh, we, can, we can do this offline, but Assistant Commissioner uh, uh, Greenfeld, I just want to, what you mentioned about, uh, to Chair uh, Ku's question about um, the property in front of their house, the homeowner's house, they could plant any tree they want did you say no, they can? They I said they can plant any vegetation. We don't. We don't. Um. Uh. We don't restrict or permit that people planting things in tree beds. Just the tree. Sorry if that was confusing. Okay, because that's what. Yeah, that's why I was concerned because now I'm telling people they can't do. They can't plant the tree. You are correct. Okay, I just want. You need a permit. You can plant. You can plant uh, um, uh, flowers. You can plant uh, other a bush or whatever. But you can't plant a tree in front of your house. That's not your land. Well, you can get a permit to plant a tree, and our permits it's, are free. You can get a permit, but you just mm -hmm. can't put anything, any tree you want there. What you said originally, it looked like that, and that was uh, that was concerning because apologies. Then, Sorry, that was, that was confusing. I was telling people the opposite. You know that you can't plant a tree, uh, you know, yourself unless you do get a permit because there's gas lines, water lines, everything else underneath there. And that would be very, very dangerous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, next up is Councilmember Rivera, followed by Councilmember Drum, and followed by Councilmember Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate your time. I know you addressed some of what I'm going to ask you, but if you don't mind just going over a little bit of two things related to the bills that were that are being heard today one for council member Ku's bill intro 2365 in recent storms this year particularly hurricane ida how did city agencies collaborate to address the down trees and i guess what i'm really asking is can you speak to the greatest challenges in terms of interagency coordination and what lessons were learned that would be implemented in the down tree task force that this bill proposes? Um, <clears throat> Hurricane Ida, the devastation that it brought to the city was significant. Uh, fortunately, it was not uh, a major tree uh, incident. Uh, we did have tree damage. Uh, the down tree task force was activated. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we did not have to deploy it uh, to its full extent to address the, the damage that occurred uh, as a result of, of Tropical Storm or Hurricane Ida. Uh, but in general, uh, what we've learned from recent deployments of the Down Trees Task Force uh, is that uh, one of the most important improvements that we can make is to integrate all of the agency data systems in a way that allows them to function as one, uh, one, one unified uh, system. Unfortunately, uh, many agencies, they have developed their own internal uh, programs and systems to manage information. Uh, they don't align easily and they do create some barriers uh, to, uh, to, to productivity, I would say, uh, during uh, major storm events. Fortunately, after Tropical Storm Isaias, uh, the city did make a commitment to uh, developing what we refer to as the Down Tree Task Force portal uh, that would integrate uh, the information processes of multiple agencies into one, um, what we hope is will be a seamless system that will allow us to communicate, uh, respond, and to report uh, 
in a unified in a uniform way all of the work that goes into responding to a, a tree incident, a, a major tree incident. Okay, well, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, as my council members mentioned, we just we really do just want to be helpful. I guess yes. my last question, while I have some time, speaking of un unification. Uh, Council Member Drummies, he has a great bill um, that would require the Parks Department to issue a report with recommendations uh, um, regarding increasing the number of trees planted in response to requests for street trees. And, and I would like to know how would this report consider equity in distribution of parks resources across the five boroughs? And thank you so much for your time and answering my questions. It's a great question. Uh, question, Council Member, and the ironic thing is that based on the history of requests, if we only planted based on request, we would sort of, per we, we, we are at risk of perpetuating the current um, sort of unevenness of the tree canopy across the city. So in fact, we do identify areas where trees are needed regardless of whether requests come in or not and plant those also while we're responding to requests. So we want to plant where people want trees. We know they want them, they take care of them, but we also know not everybody thinks about requesting a tree. It's not their number one concern in their daily lives. And we are looking at the entire city. So De Mayor de Blasio allocated funding uh, for the Cool Neighborhoods Program, which specifically looks at areas with very high heat vulnerability. And we, um, we plant based on those priorities, not just on requests, although we recognize requests are also important. So we do both at the same time. Thank you so much. I know my colleagues have questions about their bills. So thank you for your time and answering my question and to my colleagues for introducing this great set of bills. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Drum followed by Council Member Brooks Powers. Start Thank you now. very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me just start off by saying um, I'm not sure really why you came to the hearing today, uh, Parks, if you're not willing to discuss the legislation that we're hearing. Uh, it's almost insulting that uh, you made a one or two sentence statement in your testimony uh, that, uh, you know, you can't talk about the legislation because there's too much of it and uh, you'll talk about it offline. Well, that's not what hearings are for. Um, so, um, you know, I think that probably what we'll just do is just pass it. If that's the way you feel, you don't wanna talk about it, you don't wanna discuss it, we'll just pass it. Um, and it's unfortunate that this is the type of attitude that Parks has given us on a number of occasions. Let me give you an example of what it is that I mean. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Kavanaugh, as you know, I have for years, um, since I began in the city council, uh, talked to Parks about the deforestation of Jackson Heights specifically, and in regard to allowing Con Edison to determine tree policy in the city of New York. Uh, and nothing has ever been done on it. There's been no plan. Nobody has ever followed up with me on it. Um, only one time did I have a meeting in my office where forestry almost got into a fisticuffs with Con Ed. Um, and I'd really like to know, you know, why are you allowing Con Edison to determine tree policy in the city of New York? Uh, Councilor, thank you for the question. And um, I apologize uh, if we gave the impression that we did not want to discuss the legislation. Uh, we just thought that with so many pieces of legislation that the discussion would occur during the Q&A between the sponsor and, and us. And if we were wrong about that, I apologize. Uh, I do want to say again, though, that we think there is value in, in almost every piece of legislation that we're considering today. Uh, we, again, we'd like to try to address it in a comprehensive way that, that meets the, the uh, sort of the, the driving forces behind the intent of the legislation uh, and does it in a way that allows us to be as effective as possible. Uh, but with regard to Con Ed, I, Con Ed does not determine uh, tree policy in the city of New York. They operate uh, on streets under permission from the city of New York and the Parks Department, then uh, they, they do not determine po policy for trees or tree But they determine where you place trees or replace replace trees. 
Council member, no, they, they, they don't have no role in, in determining where to plant trees or- Well, you that. take the recommendation from Con Edison and you use that as the reason not to replant trees. Um, I have a whole list of trees in my district that we have sent you that we have requested to have replaced in pits in Jackson Heights. And the response has been that because Con Edison or lines, electric lines underneath it will not support it, that you cannot replant trees. I've even asked for just a bush. Can I get a bush? Thank you for the question. I, I The conditions in that neighborhood, Jackson Heights, really does trouble me. So I apologize if you don't, um, if we, we really haven't been talking to you about it. I, I really don't want that, those conditions to stand where you have beautiful lined streets of trees that grew on top of very shallow um, uh, electric utility lines. It's an extremely unusual situation. Um, and, I, and I know it's frustrating to have to wait so long. We're in fact um, working now to trial a new kind, to have our growers grow a new kind of tree in a, in a bag instead of in a bigger package, just so we could sort of trial them in that neighborhood. We can plant smaller trees a little bit higher. It's very slow, I understand, but it is something that we are not going to let go of and we'll meet with you again to, to look at it and see what we can do. It, it is a troubling situation, but it is extremely unusual across um, in terms of what it represents, what we see across the rest of the city. Well, I, I have spoken to other council members who have had the same issue. I don't know how widespread, but other council members have uh, said that they have the same issue. I, I need to want to go. I want to go on to other questions, though. But that is very troubling to me. Uh, let me give you another example of an issue. Len Meniachi, who's on this uh, call here, you'll probably know who he is. He's been a great advocate for trees. He asked for, uh, but was turned down to get trees on 34th Avenue in the median because the median wasn't high enough and they couldn't support it. Although there were trees there before, we were asking for replacement trees. So that's another example. Uh, Chair, may I have a couple more minutes to go on? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Please continue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, and that's another area. Now, I think we've settled that because we're supposedly going to get 66 trees there, but the pushback on that was tremendous. So I just want to mention that. Um, I, I, I want to say also that Council Member Gennaro, who I spoke with, says that he offered Parks money this year in the budget to get trees placed in his district was, but was told by Parks that they didn't want the money. How do you respond to that? Council member, I don't know who would turn down funding for planting trees. Uh, I wouldn't ever. And if council member Gennaro uh, is willing to fund planting in his district, we'll be happy to take it. So and I, I also want to say- for that? Excuse me? Yes, sorry. tree planting is a capitally eligible activity. And, and I just want to also acknowledge Len Maniach. We work closely with him. And uh, if we, we made a mistake on 34th Street medians and we're happy to correct it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for admitting that. It really is very, very helpful uh, because we cannot turn away our most important advocates for tree uh, canopies in, in our different communities. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's probably other stories. Let me go just go to my legislation, uh, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh as well. Um, is there anything in there that you would object to? It's basically a reporting bill. Now I did hear Assistant Commissioner Greenfield say that you don't always wanna just plant trees in neighborhoods where the reports are coming in. And I agree with that, I do agree with that. But uh, knowing where the trees are needed, uh, providing that report to the public and particularly to the city council um, is very important to us. And also determining the reasons why trees cannot be planted in certain locations, getting a real reason is important to the council also so that we can determine moving forward what type of a budget you would need to replace these trees or to come up with an overall plan. So can you address my legislation specifically and um, ask me and, and, and just tell me what type of an objection would you have to this reporting legislation. Council member, I don't have a, an objection per se to the reporting mechanism. I think, uh, as I said earlier, 
I think more information is always better. Uh, and it, it's, it's important to inform both the elected officials and the public about what we're doing and why we're doing it and why we can't do something. And there are cases where we can't plant a tree, it will not survive. Uh, and I, I think having that, in, that information available is important. Uh, again, I think when looking at the entire package of legislation, there are elements of both information uh, and communication uh, that I think we could accomplish more effectively, not by eliminating the legislation, I'm not suggesting that, uh, but by treating it uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader fashion uh, and having more tools available uh, to provide the information. And we like to really have an opportunity to discuss that. This, this is not you know, a forum in which we can have that kind of a detailed conversation, uh, but we would really relish the opportunity to speak with you and your colleagues about it and how we can uh, you know, explain better what we're doing and, and, and address the concerns that both you and your constituents raise, as well as plan for uh, the future of the urban forest, which is essential to a, to a healthy New York. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I did hear uh, Council Member Rivera raise a concern, which I think is legitimate about, uh, you know, communities not always calling in the, the needs uh, in certain communities and the need to address the, I think, as the Deputy, as the Assistant Commissioner said, the hot zones or the, the, the heat zones that uh, may need it as well. And that could be put, uh, you know, into the bill. But finally, let, let me just ask a little bit about uh, the urban forest agenda. Is that something that you support? Are you aware of it? And um, are you moving in that direction? Um, I know that you're, I think you're on the, the coalition or the task force that uh, worked on that, but uh, how active have you been and how aligned with that agenda are our priorities in the city? Yes, we are, we are aware. We were actively involved in the urban forest agenda. Uh, we think it's a, it's, a, it's a really important step forward uh, for the city of New York. Uh, it, holds the promise of, of moving us, the entire city, uh, to a more sustainable, resilient future that addresses uh, uh, issues of environmental justice as well as the looming threats of climate change. Uh, and it's important that it's driven by both the nonprofit sector and individuals. Uh, it's not just you know, government uh, that is uh, behind this and that is uh, you know, the impetus for uh, what we think is a really important initiative. And Commissioner Kavanaugh, I think part of that is the um, uh, idea that um, uh, in the legislation also that I've introduced into the council, which is regulation uh, regarding the cutting down of trees on private property. Is that something that the Department of Parks has looked at as well, regulating the cutting down of trees on private property? Uh, Council member, to my knowledge, there are, there are very limited um, circumstances. There are special zoning districts where the city has any uh, jurisdiction over trees on private property. Uh, it is a, something to, that should be discussed, I believe, but it's a it's it's a you know it's it's a charged subject uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, but when you look at canopy cover, you're looking at the entire city, not just the trees that the Parks Department is responsible for or other public agencies, it's all trees, whether they're on private property or public property. Well, thank, thanks, um, uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh. And I don't know that I'll be in office long enough for that discussion to happen, but certainly I think it's one that we should have and one that I support, uh, which is the regulation of the cutting down of trees on private property. Um, thank you very much. And I thank the chair again for allowing me to go over time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Hi, and uh, good morning, everyone. I will be less than five minutes because I am now running over for an event. Um, I have a couple of questions, Commissioner, that um, I'll just run through real quick and um, hope that you'll be able to um, answer before I have to um, jump off of this call. So I'm interested in knowing how the city plans long-term to protect the trees and support their resiliency from the threat of stronger future storms as we see um, with the change, the climate change and how it's been impacting um, the communities across the city. I'm especially interested in that. Also, what is the average response time for the city to address tree damage 
or other issues and what is being done to make the responses more efficient. And I'll just add on to that. I've had a couple of constituents impacted by the um, East Side, as far as the East Side East. And um, the trees have up, been uprooted um, on the sidewalk. And what we've seen is a breakdown in communication between the Parks Department and other sister agencies in addressing um, issues that come as a result of um, these trees being uprooted. And so I'm interested in understanding how we can better streamline that. And then um, just going back, I know a lot of questions have been asked about um, the maintenance of the trees. I'm especially interested when we talk about outer boroughs because unlike Manhattan, our wires, our, um, you know, our cable wires and what have you are above ground. And when the trees grow out of control, they grow into those wire and cre creating um, safety issues. And then when a storm happens, we have um, a lot of outages as a result. So wanting to know how we can um, better address uh, that as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for your questions, council member. Uh, start at the, at the beginning, if I remember correctly, uh, resiliency and, and uh, the resiliency of the urban forest, particularly in your community, there are two major things that we focus on and that is creating a more diverse urban forest, which, uh, allows it to be healthier, better respond to storms. That's something we've been developing over the last 20 plus years. And we've seen some really significant improvements in the composition of the urban forest. Uh, but the, the, the real cornerstone, as I said earlier, is, is our block pruning program. We prune between 70 and 80,000 years in a systematic basis, a percentage in each community board every single year. Uh, it provides maintenance, it removes you know, dead wood and other problematic conditions in those trees. It helps us to identify trees that, have con that, are, that need other work besides pruning as well. It's, it's really important. Uh, and we, you know, we had a, a study that was done by students at Columbia University who looked at our block pruning program and looked at the effect it has in, in subsequent years and they found a noticeable reduction in emergencies in areas that were block pruned. Uh, so that was a grateful sort of validation of the importance of this program. Continuing that uh, is, is, is really critical uh, to the long-term health of the urban forest. And thankfully, under this administration, we have maintained funding for block pruning at a, at a very high level. Uh, to the other question that you see is, uh, and having to do with, uh, it's primarily Con Edison. Uh, Con Edison uh, utility lines, service lines, essential. It provides electrical service to uh, homes and businesses and huge, huge uh, installations and facilities across the city. Uh, it is delivered above ground. Uh, we do work with Con Edison on their maintenance of the trees. They have a, uh, a program in place to do what they call line clearance. That is, they clear branches uh, from the vicinity of the lines. I think it's a three-year cycle, but please don't quote me on that. Uh, I, I haven't been uh, uh, and directly involved in it lately on a three-year cycle. Uh, we work with them on that. They also work with us uh, to remove trees that need to be removed that are growing through wires. Our staff is not certified uh, to work around electrical hazards, which as you can imagine, does propose, do propose uh, a real significant risk uh, to people working in their vicinity. Uh, so we, we do work closely with Con Ed uh, around those issues throughout the year. Uh, and we do collaborate with Con Ed uh, during major storms like ECES uh, to address both the tree damage and to restore electrical service as quickly as possible. Uh, I do want to apologize to people who have been waiting uh, for the sidewalks to be repaired. Time expired. Uh, it, it was not so much a question of coordination with other agencies. Uh, I, my, my sense is that as a result of of the pandemic and the, and the significant delays that it posed to the city's contracting processes. Uh, it took longer to get contracts in place to do those repairs. They are now in place. Uh, they're out there working is my understanding. Uh, and we hope to see those sidewalks all repaired in the next few months. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, at this time, there are no other members with questions. If you have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will now turn it back to Chair Coop. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So, uh, commissioners, uh, I have a, a couple more questions. Uh, my first question is, what is your position on my bills? And what do you find to be problematic uh, with the bills? Council, you're, you're referring to uh, intro 98? 98A and 2365 and 2366. Okay, uh, with, with the uh, tree beds, uh, we, 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 we agree uh, that tree beds should either be filled with a tree, ideally, uh, or uh, if, they, if they are no longer suitable for planting for whatever reason, uh, they, they should be restored as, as elements of the sidewalk. Uh, we, we agree with that. Uh, the concern, of course, is the cost of, of doing so. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, we remove between eight and 12,000 trees a year. Uh, replacing those trees, uh, you know, if we replaced all of them, it would require a budget allocation, a capital budget allocation of about $30 million just to do that on an annual basis, uh, which you know, we don't have in our budget right now. So while we completely understand the intent and we agree with the premise of replacing trees as quickly as possible, uh, it does become a budget issue. Okay. Um, can you also like, uh, tell us your position on council member uh, Borrelli's bill 957 and, uh, and how you estimate the cost of replacing uh, lawfully Remove tree. Thank you for the question, Council Member. We follow a process that was uh, developed Intro and codified. 957. I'm sorry, that was developed and codified as a result of legislation introduced by the Council uh, in 2010. Uh, we follow the uh, principles uh, laid out by the International Society of Arboriculture and the Council of Tree Plant Appraisal Guide uh, to evaluate every tree that's considered for removal based on the size, the species, the condition, and the location of the tree. Uh, each of those elements are evaluated, uh, a value is assigned, uh, and we come up with what we, what we determine to be the appropriate number of replacement trees uh, for any tree that is proposed for removal. Uh, we think it's a fair and valid uh, assessment approach. Uh, and while there have been some objections raised to it because of the high values that are placed on uh, especially large and healthy trees, uh, we think it does represent the value that trees provide to the community and the city as a whole. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are always willing to discuss ways to protect trees and prevent them from being removed, which is our goal in all cases, uh, and to work with either individual homeowners or developers uh, to find ways to, well, of course, for, to pre preserve the tree or uh, you know, to replace it in a way uh, that, is, uh, that is as cost efficient as possible. However, uh, I. It, it seems problematic to me to uh, adjust a, a citywide law to a, a you know to a specific class of, of zoning types. Um, I understand the, the 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 reasoning behind it. I, I just don't know if that's a from a from a policy perspective is that the right approach to take. Uh, Commissioner. You haven't said anything about my bills 2365 and 2366 about the uh, down tree task force. Well, council member, as, as you know, you know, the down tree task force exists. It has, uh, has been in place for, uh, for many years since, since Hurricane Sandy, at least. Uh, and it does, you know, uh, embody, uh, I think, many of the things that you anticipate in the legislation. And in fact, there was an earlier version of the legislation that uh, 
that we work with the council uh, and have adopted within the Downtree Task Force. So we, we think the Downtree Task Force is a really uh, important tool. Uh, we want the public to understand how it functions more. Uh, however, we are not, the Parks Department is not the only member of the Downtree Task Force. Uh, and other agencies, I think, had some concerns about, uh, about some of the elements in the legislation. Uh, uh, I don't want to speak to them right now because I don't want to speak to another agency, to another agency's concerns. Uh, but we think the task force as it exists uh, embodies again uh, what you envisioned in the legislation. And it's another example where we think that if we are able to sit down and talk about it in more detail and involve the other uh, members of the uh, Downtree Task Force in those discussions, we can come up with uh, a, 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 legis you know, a, a law or however we want to treat it that addresses all of our concerns. Okay. Uh, what about 2366 about uh, tree health assessments and inspections? Again, uh, council member, we, uh, we, we used trained certified arborists to conduct our tree health inspections. Uh, and we have even elevated our standards for, for risk inspections. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very sort of detailed and scientific process that we go through. It's, it's a little hard to discuss it in detail uh, in, a, in a forum like this, uh, but we, we absolutely think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important subject. Uh, we'd like the public to understand more about what we do and how we do it. Uh, and I just think it's a way, it's another uh, example of a, of a good uh, initiative that the council has identified that we could address in a more comprehensive way by having an in-depth discussion about this and other legislation and addressing it more as a package than individual uh, pieces of legislation. Thank you. Yeah. So can you speak... Uh to how central forestry works with formal forestry teams. Uh, what is the breakdown of the responsibilities between the central uh, forestry and the local uh, formal uh, forestry teams? Yes, thank you for the question, Council Member Pu. Uh, the borough forestry offices are responsible for delivering all of the day-to-day -day tree maintenance that occurs within the borough. That includes tree removal, tree pruning, stump removal, and emergency response, as well as conducting inspections for service requests for street and park trees within that borough. Uh, they oversee the maintenance contracts, whether it is stump removal contract or, uh, or, or, or the block pruning contracts. Uh, and again, they, they, they deliver the day-to-day -day services uh, that the parks department is responsible for uh, when it comes to maintaining the urban forest. Central forestry, on the other hand, that performs a number of functions uh, that fall outside of the borough's responsibilities. They uh, manage the street tree, all of our tree planting contracts uh, in a centralized way, uh, both street tree and park tree planting. It's a specialized uh, part of the business uh, and it really requires uh, uh, you know, intense focus in order to do it effectively and at the scale that we operate. They also run several other important programs, including permit and plan review. That is, we, uh, we review uh, permit, we review plans for any work on the streets that can impact street trees. Uh, again, it's a situation where it's a, it's a, it's a specialized uh, function uh, where we decided that we needed uh, expertise that focused solely on that aspect of, of maintaining trees. Uh, and they handle the entire process, working closely with the buildings department, uh, other agencies around issues that arise from development that impact street trees. Uh, Central Forestry also coordinates the procurement around all of our contracting. Uh, so they help organize the, the block pruning contracts, the stump removal contracts, the emergency contracts that we use during large scale storm events uh, and that are essential to responding 
to widespread emergencies during those events. Uh, but they have staff that are familiar with those processes uh, and work to have those contracts in place uh, for the boroughs to sort of use uh, in delivering direct services. They also are our research and development arm of the agency. They are involved in uh, direct research projects that we conduct, but they also are part of a network of professionals across the agency, across the country rather, uh, starting with the Forest Service uh, that do an enormous amount of research into urban forestry, uh, as well as uh, propose advances in, in both in both uh, the way that we do our business and, and in, in our management of trees. So there, there are very distinctive differences between the two programs, but they work together uh, to help us maintain the urban forest. And I would just ask Commissioner Greenfeld if she had anything she wanted to add to that. Yes, uh, the Central Forestry Office also managed our, our sidewalk repair trees and sidewalks program. Um, that you know repair sidewalks for residential one, two, and three family homes that have been damaged by city trees. That's also a very specialized um, contracting uh, program. I think that's all. Um, we are also, the Central Forestry Office is also responsible for data management and the data management systems along with our own ITT department. Thank you. So Commissioner, uh, does each borough have a certified arbonist on forestry uh, staff? Uh, what about central forestry? Uh, Councilmember, yes, each borough has multiple certified arborists on staff. But the, the arborists only do supervising, right? They don't actually do inspection. No, the, the certified arborists do inspection. They do the inspections themselves? Yes. Well, we, have a, we have 80 certified arborists on our staff on the citywide across the agency. We might be, have the most of any city that I know of uh, to have uh, certified uh, professionals in that way. And not all of them do tree inspections on the regular part of their work. They can all do tree inspections, certainly during emergencies uh, and you know, in other times. But I would say that we have probably between 35 and 40 people who are certified arborists whose full-time work is inspecting trees. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Council Member Eric and Dinovich. And Council Member Dinovich has a question. Time starts now. Thank you, good morning. It's a pleasure to see you here, Deputy Commissioner and all the other guests. Um, I'll be, I'll, I'll be quick, you spoke about um, some work being distributed by borough. You spoke about some work being distributed citywide. Um, I'm interested in trees. Um, you know, it's besides trees being pretty, improving our quality of life. Here in the Bronx, I, I represent the, the Northwest corner of the Bronx District 11, um, but we know in the Bronx there's serious air quality problems. Uh, we know trees, uh, help absorb rainwater. And I don't know if you saw the pictures recently of the Major Deegan where cars were up to the roofs of the car. Um, there are other issues <laughs> regarding that, but we know that trees can at least help in other rainstorms absorb some of that stormwater, whether it's holding it in the tree canopy or absorbing it through the roots. For, you know, as an example on Bailey Avenue in my district, it's right next to the Major Deegan, next to a playground across the street from the NYCHA development, um, a bunch of tree stumps along the street where trees could be there, right? We're talking about kids playing next to a highway without those trees to improve the air quality. We're talking about that highway being the major deacon without those trees uh, to help absorb that rainwater, that stormwater. And we're talking about across the street from a NYCHA development. Um, I'm interested to know how that work is distributed, how the resources are distributed. So areas like the Bronx don't, don't continue to suffer um, from or where our children don't continue to suffer from asthma and poor air quality. And we don't continue to see the types of environmental injustice that we see throughout the Bronx compared to many other areas of the city. So again, how that work and how those resources are distributed 
considering the, the high needs in my district in the Bronx? Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. And yes, trees play an important role in managing stormwater. Uh, our street trees alone absorb estimated almost a billion gallons of, of, of rainwater on an annual basis. It's a really important contribution to the overall health of our waterways uh, and to prevent uh, localized flooding. Uh, just as an aside, uh, the flooding in the Deegan was very severe. Uh, the trees will not solve that problem, unfortunately. However, there is a separate project that we think will, will help mitigate conditions like that in the long term. Uh, yes, but I'm happy yes, to talk to you about that project too, which I'm very excited yes. about another time. Yes, I will. Uh, <laughs> but yes, you, you know, your question about how do we uh, allocate resources is a very good one. And uh, Commissioner Greenfeld alluded to this earlier. Uh, you know, you have requests which are substantial. We receive 70 to 80,000 service requests in a normal year. Uh, represents a lot, of, a lot of interest on the public and their trees. Uh, on the other hand, you have this enormous resource the tree population that needs care uh, on a regular basis to the extent that we possibly can. We try to balance that as, as well as possible. And that does come into play in, in our tree planting. Uh, you know, we, we do want to fulfill requests. That's important. People want trees. We want them to have trees. We know that they'll take care of trees. Uh, but that system alone led to a lot of imbalances across the city, something that we in the Parks Department recognized uh, years ago, in fact. Uh, that those imbalances existed. And I'm, I'm really pleased uh, of the work that we did in the Bronx uh, when we did our first street tree census in 1995, 1996, there were about 84,000, I'm sorry, there were 48,000 street trees in the Bronx, uh, way low. Uh, the last census, we were over 84,000 in the Bronx. And they went into neighborhoods that had so really low populations of street trees. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a story that we think is important. It responded to what we were hearing uh, from community advocates who were extremely concerned about the environmental justice. Uh, and it's something that you know, we want to continue to, to address uh, while we balance both the requests that we receive and the real, real needs that uh, communities have yeah. that have not been met over many years. Thank you, and, and I, I do appreciate and value the, the increase in the number of street trees and, and trying to provide that balance. Can you talk a little more about how you balance the requests? Because what I'm thinking in my mind is a very affluent neighborhood uh, with uh, you know people who are engaged or involved or maybe have more free time are able to submit those requests or able to stay on the parks department. Time Whereas, expired. Chair, may I please uh, have an extra uh, extend my yeah, time? Please, uh, please finish up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, you know how you are balancing the, the reality that people's requests need to be addressed, but that a lot of those requests, I imagine, are coming from again more affluent neighborhoods compared to to like I said, my my neighborhood. It's this particular street as an example. It's just a lot, a lot of kids and teenagers are playing there. May not reach out to parks or three one one. For the tree requests, um, you know, I, I get a neighborhood uh, that needs a lot more and may not be reaching out to parks, may not be calling through one, or may not be calling their local uh, council member to do that outreach. So, so how that balance is is occurring? Yeah, it. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> we we try to address both at the same time. Um, they're both very important, as the commissioner said. We want to respond to where people are interested in trees, but simultaneously, we are monitoring where our trees are, both our canopy and our street and park tree population. And we know that there are deficits in certain neighborhoods. So, you know, we've had several different programs over the years. Our current program is based upon heat and where um, neighborhoods are most vulnerable to the impacts of high heat. And that's those are the communities that we're prioritizing um, uh, at the same time uh, as we uh, fulfill service requests. Um, and that is broken down as small as a um, community board, I think, perhaps as small as neighborhood. And uh, we can you know, look at it in, in sort of any geographical area, but we are in fact need to identify some criteria so we equitably distribute the resource that we do have. And, and, and that, um, 
is it a heat index? Is it average temperature? Is that information it, publicly available? Yes, yes. It's a it's called the heat vulnerability index. It's actually developed by our Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. It's not a Parks Department index, and it takes into consideration not just the temperature, but um, I believe the sort of demographics of a neighborhood as well as their access to air conditioning. So it's it's a multi factor um, index that uh, they most recently updated in 2018. Okay, so so my this is my 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 last part. So so my assumption is that the the neighborhoods with that that higher heat index that is available on the DOHMH website kind of has a little more preference to new is it new trees or is it tree maintenance? What is it? We are, right now we we only use it to guide we use it to guide our tree planting. Not all of it, of course. There's also service requests and other reasons we plan. If a right, council right. member gives us an allocation, it goes directly into their neighborhood, et cetera. Um, but the HVI is just used to guide our cool neighborhoods program, which is funded by Mayor de Blasio. Uh, we don't use the HVI to guide our tree management, our pruning, um, or response to conditions that we hear. That is based on risk alone, um, which is about safety and not a question of deficit of, of tree canopy. Okay, uh, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you, Chair Koo. Thank you. Uh, commissioners and uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we have uh, more questions, but we are send it to you by email. So now we want to do public hearing. <clears throat> uh, Chris, can you uh, go on to do a public hearing? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Uh, as the Chair said, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical in-person council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. So please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a specific panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you in order after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, again, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before beginning your testimony. At this time, I would like to ask Emily Maxwell of the Nature Conservancy to uh, present her testimony. It will be followed by Tara Das of the New York Restoration Project. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Maxwell from the Nature Conservancy, also a member of the Forest for All NYC Coalition. And really want to say that what's amazing about today's hearing um, is that everybody who's speaking is in favor of trees. And so that's a commonality that we all share. And I think it's incredible to see the love and passion that all of you are bringing. Thank you so much to Chairman Pu and the whole committee for hosting this hearing. Um, Briefly, the Nature Conservancy has about 35,000 members in New York City, and the Forest for All NYC Coalition has 40 and counting organizations. Um, we are composed of nonprofits, businesses, academics, and government partners working together to protect, maintain, and grow the urban forest in New York City. Um, I'll speak a bit quickly, and I won't read my whole testimony, but I do want to say that Forest for All NYC focuses on the whole of the urban forest, and that is the 7 million trees, and actually more than 7 million trees, that span both public and private property across the city and the physical and social infrastructure that support them. We see um, these trees, this urban forest as an essential system that provides enormous benefits and services to New Yorkers. And because so many people have gone on record with those benefits, I will um, leave you to say we, we have been watching those and more. Um, but also that in the face of COVID-19 and the growing impacts of climate change, including extreme heat and flooding, the benefits of the urban forest, including its mental health benefits, are even more important than ever. But unfortunately, the urban forest is vulnerable. Um, it faces insufficient funding for long-term care, lacks a coordinated management plan that cuts across that entirety of the system, um, and is largely unprotected from removal on both public and private lands. 
It also faces equity issues across the city, which can have impacts on um, New Yorkers of color and low income New Yorkers who are, don't typically enjoy as much tree canopy and its benefits. And I'll say that while, of course, the Parks Department is such an important steward, they own just over half or they manage just over half of the urban forest canopy. And actually, nearly 35% of the canopy is on private property and more than 11% is actually managed by other agencies. And so when we think about the forest, we really need to think about it across these, um, these systems. Um, so funding for our trees is critical. We recently launched the New York City Urban Forest Agenda, as some of you have spoken about, which we greatly appreciate. And we want to see the city establish a goal of 30% canopy cover by 2035. That will require master planning. they will require community level planning. It will require more funding, better regulation and incentive programs. And so, you know, we are also in support of a more comprehensive package. And while I'm very Time pleased to hear- Thank you. I'll just say thank you so much and we'll submit more in writing. If you, if you hadn't finished, please, uh wrap up. Feel free to oh. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say briefly, we are unable to support legislation that would weaken standards for the urban forest. There are a few pieces of legislation that do so that will be in my written testimony. And we're really looking forward to working with council to improve this legislation so that it aligns to the goals of our urban forest agenda, is ecologically and operationally sound, improves public information, advances equity and justice, and supports climate resilience. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is Tara Das, who will be followed by Carlos uh, Crook. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to the members of the council for convening this hearing and to the Parks Committee Chair, Peter Ku, for your leadership and support. My name is Tara Das, and I am a Government Affairs Manager of New York Restoration Project. For over 25 years, <laughs> planted trees, renovated gardens, restored parks, and transformed green spaces for underserved communities throughout New York City. In 2015, NYRP made history by making it New York City the first major city to successfully plant over 1 million trees. As one of the city's leading supporters for urban forest and access to nature, we believe it is a fundamental right to have access to critical green space, including, including urban forests, and especially as we continue to navigate the worsening effects of climate change. We know that trees provide a paramount line of defense to the risk of increased flooding, heat waves, and environmentally induced illnesses. I'd also like to stress that with Black and Latinx communities facing a higher likelihood of dying after five days of extreme heat, as well as greater exposure to areas of polluted air environmental risk, trees play a key role in fighting systemic injustice. Unfortunately, the US is currently losing trees faster than they are replacing them. Across the country, about 4 million urban trees are lost each year. This is coupled with the Parks Department being dramatically underfunded and community organizations such as ourselves facing great administrative and financial barriers to growing and maintaining the city's trees. Beyond tree planting, effective tree stewardship is needed to ensure tree <laughs> maturity and effectively mitigate the concerns our communities face. A random sampling of New York City street trees planted between 1999 and 2003 found that less than 75% were still alive at the time of the survey, four years later. If we are to reverse the risks of our communities face, we need to be able to plant and grow trees efficiently, and we need the city's support to maintain the trees full strength and full growth. That is why we stand with Forest for All in New York City in supporting legislation that will further prioritize the urban forest, as well as support the community-based organizations leading the city's preservation and expansion of trees. We demand the support of community-scale urban forest plans and goals, increasing and equitably distributing funding for planting and maintenance like, and strengthening regulations and incentive programs that promote tree planting throughout the city on all types of properties. Thank you for having me today, and thank you for reviewing options to support the city's tree canopy. We look forward to working with you to advance effective and efficient policy that supports New York City's urban trees. Thank you very much. I believe Councilmember Drum has a question. Time starts now. And I also know people who have been victims of um, false allegations, and it concerns
Council member, I believe. Council member, if you could hold yeah. for a second, I believe we lost you for a second. Uh, um, oh, yeah, you know. If you could if you could restart, please. We've lost a good chunk of what you were saying. Yeah, you know, but look what they did to Scott Strand. You know, and, and I just don't think it's right, really. You know, yeah. okay. I think we had some technical issues with Councilmember Drum. I think we'll move on to the next panelist until we get that sorted. Uh, so our next panelist will be uh, Carlos Croak. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people our neighborhoods and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Ku and all the council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The trees that make up our urban forest are one of the city's most mm. valuable environmental assets, mitigating climate change, providing clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributing to the well being of our residents and economy. Protecting and expanding this resource is a top priority for NYLCV. We are proud to be here with our partners from the Playfair Parks Campaign and the Forest for All NYC Coalition to support trees, the parks they live in, and our urban forest. We are co-founders along with New York for Parks and DC 37 of the Playfair Campaign, which fights every year for parks funding in the New York City budget. We are adamant that New York City Parks needs at least 1% of the total city budget baseline yearly in order to fund vital forestry contracts for tree pruning, stump removal, sidewalk repair, and invasive species control. Additionally, with the Forest for All NYC uh, Coalition, we hope to work with the council to expand our urban forest by establishing a goal of 30% canopy cover by 2035 and resourcing a master plan to manage this expanding forest. These investments will be critical to improving the environmental benefits of our parks and urban forests. Currently, the 2.6 million street and park trees that the Parks Department are responsible for remove 1,300 tons of pollutants from the atmosphere and store 1 million tons of carbon each year. Trees, will, trees are vital for mitigating the urban heat island effect and can lower temperatures by up to nine degrees, cut air conditioning use by 30% and reduce heating energy use by a further 20 to 50%. New York City's parks also contribute to our resiliency by capturing almost 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Because of these numerous benefits, we must see massive investments in our parks and urban forests to help us protect New Yorkers and fight climate change now. Because of that, NYLCV also opposes intro 957 and intro 199 as these bills seek to lower standards and protections for New York City's urban forests when we need to be moving in the opposite direction. I'd like to thank Chair Ku for his partnership and the Committee on Parks and Recreation for their attention to the importance of trees and our urban forest. I look forward to working with you all closely to ensure that New York City has healthy and thriving green spaces for generations to come. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Roxanne Delgado, followed by Sky Pape. Time starts now. Are you able to hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Please. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'd like to discuss about the trees damaged by commercial lawn mowers by parks. On June 6th of last year, over a dozen trees were damaged by NYC Parks lawn mower. It looked like a crime scene with trees mutilated and their shredded bark spread on the grounds. I notified the NYC park manager. There was no response, no action taken. And parks continued to damage our trees um, the following month in August 4th of last year. And then this year, on April 24th and April 30th, more trees were, uh, were damaged. Until I contact News 12 about the incidents, yet the trees and shrubs killed by NYC parks still are not replaced. So I really find it very... Um, discerning that our own agency, instead of protecting our trees, are actually behind harming the trees. Whether it was intentional or not, the trees, the, the, the result still remains the same. The trees were, were uh, mutilated and some killed as a result of the uh, mowing the lawn. Trees damaged and killed by barbecuing. We've been asking for uh, no barbecue signs from park managers for the last three years. And finally, we were given two signs right before July 4, but the signs were installed improperly, so they, each, they fell off. And anyhow, parks enforcement cannot enforce the, the no barbecue um, 
rules because there's no uh, administration or park manager that is supporting them to do so. It looks like they encourages uh, barbecuing despite the fact that it harms our trees. We have tree barks that are burned by the uh, flames. We also have coals that kill the trees that are dumped right on the tree pits. And I had submitted pictures of these uh, coals on the trees and all the trees damaged by the low mower. So um, I would really, really want this to be addressed because uh, what's the use of planting trees if we don't protect the trees? It's, I mean, it makes no purpose when trees are being killed by the park's lawnmower or they're being damaged by illegal barbecuing because there's no signage and there's no um, um, enforcement. It's just, you know, appearance sake, but there's no um, enforcement of the rule, which is really behind the park manager. Unless the park manager gives the park enforcement the support to enforce the rules, they won't do so. And lastly, this is the most important thing that affects Pelham Parkway, environmental justice. We lost over 75 trees due to the Re Pelham Parkway reconstruction project too. And as a result of these trees were removed based on design and some were based on condition. But what's sadly is that parks removed over 18 oak trees within a five block radius on Pelham Parkway Greenway. And these oak trees should have been left alone to die a natural death because they have full leaf canopies and they have uh, no dead wood. I mean, when I saw the stumps, they were clean and, and uh, solid. But yet parks removed them. And in fact, instead of replacing these oak trees, they put non-native trees. And they replanted the oak trees on the side of the homeowners. So where I live is where NYCHA and low-income immigrants live. But we're on the side of where the uh, homeowners are, a different zip code, they planted the oak trees, but they gave us Japanese okovas. Not that I have anything against Japanese okovas, but the fact is that they removed 18 oak trees from outside and then planted zero oak trees. And parks refused to provide us with tree Time planting. Plant. Let me just, before the contract planted the trees, they refused to answer our questions. They kept us in the dark. CBS2 came to us and we even cried on TV because we felt that it was injustice that this affects the future of our residents, future of our nature. Our parks are deprived us of our nature, they deprive us of our trees. This is pure definition of environmental injustice in parks. Unfortunately, instead of working with the community, they had retaliated against us, blacklist us because they just don't want to address the fact that they deprive this community of nature. They remove our trees who are in, in good conditions. They're letting the oak trees die in natural death. They remove 18 oak trees. We have no trees in our section of the Palm Parkway. We have no clean air, we have no shade, no nature because parks basically decimated that section of the parkway. And instead of making us whole again, they gave us Japanese Sokova. So I really would like this to be some sort of oversight of what has, parks has done this, this section of the parkway, which is mostly low income, NYCHA resident, black and brown people. And instead they planted our oak trees, our oak trees they planted where the homeowners are, who were, there were no trees removed there, but they planted oak trees there. And I really would like Parks and the mayor, whoever is involved in this, to be fair and have some uh, uh, justice for uh, Pelham Parkway North residents of like low income, NYCHA, low poor income, and we volunteer for five years caring for the parkway and Parks has basically turned their backs on us. Thank you for your time and have a good, good day. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sky Pape. Uh, followed by Len Maniace. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Chair Ku, City Council members, and all involved in today's hearing. Uh, my name is Sky Pape. I'm representing myself, um, but I'm connected with several local organizations involving our parks and natural areas, including New York Restoration Project, uh, Nature Conservancy, and others. Um, Complicated issues of climate change and environmental justice require more than just lip service. They require the focused and reliable allotment of money and resources. Uh, I wanna speak in general in support of the legislation put forth today, especially in 2366, and for allocating city funding and resources that we require to be dedicated to the New York City Parks Department for operations and maintenance. It seems preposterous that we need to advocate to get up to merely 1% of the total city budget for this, a goal which even if met is still woefully and terrifyingly inadequate to meet the needs at hand. Uh, not all parks have well endowed conservancies to do what the city does not. Um, I'm in Inwood in Upper Manhattan where we have the island's only natural old growth forest as well as a significant number of street trees. And here located in an environmental justice zone in this time of urgency, that kind of conservancy just doesn't exist. 
Uh, the maintenance of our parks and street trees is not a cosmetic issue. Um, if the city does not provide adequate, reliable funding for parks, Manhattan's last natural forest will go away. Uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change, dedicated funding of foresters and staff capable of evaluating and preserving the forest, including tree maintenance and management of invasives must be provided. One third of Inwood is considered to be in the floodplain and maintenance of the parks and street trees is crucial for the management of storm runoff, particularly with increasingly frequent and severe storms. The city relies overly on the work done by partner organizations like Natural Areas Conservancy, New Yorkers for Parks, Super Stewards, New York Restoration Project, and legions of public volunteers creating an unsustainable burden on them and inadequate park protection for the parks and trees. We need funding for permanent park staff to take on this work. And with this, I would include increasing the number of forestry staff and trained arborists, as well as urban park rangers. Um, finally, not only is more money needed for the city for parks operations and maintenance, but if such funds goes through <coughs> council for distribution within each district, it is imperative that these funds are directed truly towards environmental concerns in a proportion that reflects the urgency rather than having parks budgets swallowed Time whole expired. by recreation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Len Maniace, uh, followed by Michael Marino. Time starts now. Thank you. I want to echo Emily Maxwell, my colleague in the Forest for All Coalition, <coughs> excuse me, and say it's wonderful to hear so many people speak of the importance of our city's trees. My name is Len Maniachi, and I'm a director of the Jackson Heights Beautification Group, a civic, environmental, and arts group, which operates one of the leading volunteer tree care programs in our city. I'll also be submitting written testimony. We thank the city council for devoting this time to our city's trees. This summer has made clear that climate change is not off in the distant future. It's now and New York City is getting hotter. Our city needs more trees. Studies have shown that neighborhoods with many mature trees are cooler than those lacking them. Briefly put, trees are mother nature's air conditioners. We support bill number 467. It will help New Yorkers understand how well the city's Department of Parks and Recreation is carrying out its missions, its mission to plant trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, we believe three of the bills under review today will actually lead to a decrease in street trees. We believe passage of number 98 would mean the paving over of many empty tree beds that otherwise could be planted with trees. Number 199 would introduce a stricter standard for street tree planting on top of the many rules parks already has. Number 957 would allow a few trees to be planted as replacements when a mature tree is legally removed, such as for development. Other than number 467, we believe the city council should table new tree legislation until completion of a new study of our city's urban forest. That study, the NYC Urban Forest Agenda is already underway. This project aims to make our city more environmentally resilient by increasing our cooling tree canopy from the current 22% to 30%. Importantly, the NYC Urban Agenda, Forest, tree, forest Agenda, emphasizes greening our communities of color and poverty, free, which are areas frequently neglected, a matter Deputy Kavanaugh already noted. We hope the city council will support the NYC urban forest agenda and work toward its implementation. And I just wanna say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm glad to see so many officials in the parks department that I know here. And I am a big fan of New York City parks um, some of the problems that we've heard could probably be addressed and alleviated with more funding for them. But I think with um, the issues that the city is facing, just one second, please. 
the cities, the, the issues the city is now facing with uh, global warming, it's really important for parks to take the next step up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Marino, followed by Jessica Burke. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Michael Marino here representing Friends of Corlearsbrook Park from Manhattan's Lower East Side. Uh, I really wish that the Deputy Commissioner and the Assistant Commissioner had stayed on to listen to the public's testimony, but I understand they're not required to. Um, but thank you for allowing me to speak today. I wanted to, to just bring up three issues that, that Friends of Corlearsbrook Park has, has uh, dealt with tree maintenance and the confusion of reporting issues with trees. Um, first, as probably everybody already knows, part of the mitigation for the loss of the trees related to the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan includes planting of a thousand new street trees throughout community boards three and six. Corlears Hook Park received eight of these trees. In fact, there was great fanfare over the summer that the 500th tree was planted in our park. Um, unfortunately, the contractors paid to plant these trees never returned to water them. And at least half of the eight trees planted in Corlears Hook Park are now dead or on their way to dying. Um, the ones that have survived are the ones that my organization had long enough hoses to reach to water ourselves. Um, this is the second time Corlears Hook Park has received plantings from New York City parks that have died due to the lack of a maintenance and watering plan. So my question to parks would be, what are the ramifications to the contractors that do not live up to the expectations of their contract in caring for these trees that they're planting throughout the city? Another issue, this past summer, we reported to New York City Parks a, a mature linden tree that was sinking into the ground due to a rat burrow underneath its tree pit. While the forestry division responded rather quickly to cut the tree down to, to the stump, um, the stump and the, the sinking sidewalk remained. Uh, after reaching out to forestry division again, we were punted to the trees and sidewalk division. That division punted us back to the forestry division, stating, and I quote, Trees and Sidewalks program only attends to sidewalk concrete damage caused by city owned trees and adjacent to one, two or three family homes, not used for commercial purposes and occupied by the owner only. Okay, so then who deals with, with issues related to city owned trees that are, that are bordering a park or in a park? So we've been punted back and forth between the forestry division and the trees and sidewalks division and the issue is still not fixed. Uh, the tree pit and the sidewalk continue to sink into the ground, causing a major trip hazard for anybody trying to use that sidewalk to enter the park. Um, so I would, I would advocate for the process for reporting tree issues to be easier and for organizations and even individuals not to be punted back and forth between numerous different divisions within the parks department. Lastly, and I know I'm running out of time, so hopefully I get to this, uh, we had a rather large limb split off another mature tree that overhangs our city bike rack. Uh, the limb was so large that it actually touched the sidewalk and you can reach out. Time expired. And it took about a week before the parks department came out to address that limb after we reported it. The area was never roped off. It was a huge public hazard to anybody going to the city bike rack to get a bike that that limb could have fallen on them at any moment. Um, and I just think that responses to hazards like that should be quicker. So those are the three things I wanted to bring up. And like Len said, we are, you know, I think a lot of these issues are related to the lack of funding for the Parks Department in general. And, you know, outside of these three issues, we have a wonderful and great relationship with Parks and with our Park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jessica Burke, followed by Natasia Sidarte. Time starts now. Great. Thank you, Chair Koo and Council members for your time. My name is Jessica Burke. I am the founder of the program Friends of Kershaw and John Golden Park in Bayside, Queens. Our park is the 12th largest park in Queens and the 45th largest park in the city. We have monthly volunteer events, free yoga, tours of the park. We also work with NYC Park Rangers. And most impressively, we have raised over $2,000 for a replanting project and educational interpretive board for the park. I am here to speak about my experience growing this program since August 2020. I would like to call attention to the equity issues that are caused by the increase in New York City Park's reliance on public-private partnerships. 
At the moment, New York City Parks engages in a number of public-private partnerships. I have found that these partnerships tend to prioritize relationships with one another instead of working with smaller parks and smaller groups. As you know, City Parks Foundation is one of the largest public-private partnerships that NYC Parks works with. The most recent IRS filing shows that they have received over $1,700,000 from New York City Parks to work in city parks. A small amount of this is through discretionary funding that must go through the City Park Foundation acting as a fiscal sponsor for all city park groups that are not full 501c3s. That means that groups like mine that have a different fiscal sponsor because City Parks Foundation has ended their fiscal sponsorship relationship for the foreseeable future are not able to obtain funding through uh, city, uh, the city council discretionary funding. Other organizations like the Natural Areas Conservancy have a yearly revenue of over $4 million. This organization does not provide services to all areas across NYC. Trails are an important part of enjoying trees in our park. Natural Areas Conservancy is refusing to come to Crocheron Park to help us with our small trail. Even though New York for Parks, New Yorkers for Parks has shown that we have the second highest out of all 59 community boards for tree canopy cover. And myself and other volunteers of Crocheron and John Golden Park maintain trails and our trail maintainers with Natural Areas Conservancy. This leads to our park being further more vulnerable than other parks. The Natural Areas Conservancy does not provide access to their programming and they prioritize relationships with larger organizations instead, like Van Cortlandt Park Alliance and Riverside Park Conservancy that have nearly 1 million and 4 million in revenue respectively. These public-private partnerships are not the answer to the needs of our parks. We are facing a crisis of stumps that are an eyesore, but also vines that are choking out and killing trees. For aesthetics and for increased mental health, in our park, we cannot see the bay. Instead, the overlook is now filled with invasive Norway. Uh, mixed by. And if I can just say one other thing on a positive note, I would really appreciate if we could get some signs for dead trees to explain to the public that this is a tree that is not going to necessarily fall on you, that it is part of a healthy ecosystem that supports bugs and woodpeckers. We found that this is a way to help the public respect and love green space more and hopefully um, we can get more funding for parks. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Natasia Siddharte, followed by Rowan Blake. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Natasia Siddharta. I'm the Community Stewardship and Operations Director at Gowanus Canal Conservancy, or GCC. I oversee community stewardship and volunteer programs, and we empower local stakeholders in stewardship um, of local green spaces, including street trees. Um, I do want to mention that we are a proud member of the Forest for All NYC Coalition, of which many of the members are here today. Um, and we do aim to work with City Council and the Parks Committee to advance a long-term direction for the whole of the urban forest. Um, many people have mentioned this already. Um, of the 7 million trees in the city, they enhance quality of life, improve health and, and well-being for people. They help tackle the causes and effects of the climate crisis. And most relevant in Gowanus, they absorb stormwater before it pollutes our waterways. In Gowanus, we receive 363 million gallons of combined sewer overflow per year. And many of those trees um, absorb that stormwater before it enters the canal. Um, just in the past decade, 670 young trees were installed. And this has filled a neighborhood wide gap in the urban canopy. Um, they depend on adequate maintenance and protection, however. In our urban forests and the parks department, as many have mentioned already, um, who care for over half of it are chronically underfunded. We need to have consistent and sufficient funding to ensure that these trees are able to provide many of the critical services that we've all acknowledged. In Gowanus itself, we empower a network of volunteer tree stewards. Um, they water, they weed, prune, remove litter and debris, and these activities also provide social infrastructure. So they offer opportunities for neighbors to organize together, 
Um, and we've had many successes in maintaining many of these young street trees with these volunteers. We've also run into barriers. Over the past decade, we've lost numerous trees in the name of new gray infrastructure, um, including new utility lines on 7th Street, high level storm sewers on Carroll Street, um, and in a neighborhood severely lacking urban canopy, these, the loss of these trees can be devastating. Public and private entities need to be held responsible for replanting and also the protection and care for these replacement trees. Um, we encourage city council to review um, the NYC urban forest agenda if you haven't done so already, which pre presents an array of opportunities to make meaningful positive differences in our urban forests and New Yorkers. Thank you to Chairman Ku, committee members and city council for reviewing these options to support the urban forests. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Rowan Blake, uh, followed by our last registered speaker, Sharice Palomino. Game starts now. Good morning and thank you for the, or good afternoon rather, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Rowan Blake. I'm the Vice President of Horticulture at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I'm here today on behalf of BBG to voice our strong support for increased investment in the planting, management, maintenance, diversity and health of our city's urban forest and in the education training um, and development of skills for New Yorkers to act as stewards for these trees. As well as our own tree collection, BBG educates visitors and school children in the diversity and benefit of trees, works with local communities, including those in neighborhoods designated as potential environmental justice areas, uh, to help maintain their own trees and tree beds and to enter their blocks, for example, in the Greenest Block in Brooklyn program. BBG also trains the next generation of professionals working in green spaces across the city through our garden apprentice and horticultural internship programs and trains parks department trainee gardeners. Uh, earlier this year, BBG worked with uh, NYC Parks and Recreation to plant 28 new street trees outside our boundary on Flatbush Avenue. Uh, Well-maintained and managed healthy trees are vital for the city and its numerous green spaces, keeping our urban forest healthy and free of invasive species, pests and diseases is more important now than ever. In managing our own trees, BBG follows the best practice standards and certifications of the International Society of Arboriculture and liaises with the parks management uh, borough arborists and other local green spaces uh, on issues affecting local tree health. The benefits from urban trees is incredibly well evidenced as stated by many of the speakers this morning. Um, any negative impacts, whether pests and disease, uh, under planting, um, single generation, overly aged plantings, um, anything in the, 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 the management and the, the long-term resilience uh, left unaddressed could be devastating to our urban forest and the future well-being and resilience of the, the, the city depends on um, um, improvements uh, and to the prioritization of the urban forest. Um, the urban forest has a critical role to play in creating, as I said, a, a resilient New York City and one more prepared to meet the challenges of climate change. Investment in and prioritization of the urban forest uh, will pay dividends for years to come. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is uh, Sharice Palomino, who will be followed by Jessica Kaplan. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sharice Palomino, and I am the Director of Advocacy and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. We are the founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which includes many, which includes over 300 organizations from across the five boroughs, some who have already testified here today. We would like to thank the City Council Committee on Parks and Recreations for inviting us to speak about our city's trees and their maintenance. I also wanna thank Chair Ku for his leadership and partnership in the Playfair Coalition and for raising these important issues. The Parks Department is responsible for maintaining more than 2.6 million trees on our streets and in our parks. These trees and urban forests are a critical resource to the city's climate change resilience. They mitigate urban heat and island effects, 
lower temperatures by up to 9%, cut air conditioning use by 30%, and reduce heating energy use by further by 20 to 30%. Trees in our parks capture almost 2 billion gallons of storm water runoff every year, a, st a statistic made even more poignant after the impact of recent tropical storms. Our trees are essential to our public health, as well as providing shade and cleaner air, impacts that should resonate with our city's leaders, as well as continue to make our way through this pandemic. In short, trees are a central part of New York City's green infrastructure. The Parks Department does a valiant job in maintaining this critical resource, but needs more funding to do so. This is one of the many reasons why New Yorkers for Parks and our Playfair Coalition are calling for an increase in the park's budget to 1% of the city's budget, a call a majority of the city council candidates support along with the leading candidate for mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next and last registered speaker is Jessica Kaplan. Time starts now. Is Ms. Kaplan on? She was on a moment ago. Um, if not, we'll just move on. Uh, at this point, there are no other registered panelists. So I would just ask if we had inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called on to uh, give your statement. Okay, seeing none, I will now turn it back to Chairperson Ku to offer some closing remarks and close out the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to everyone for their testimony today. Our urban canopy impacts all, in all aspects of our lives, and we must do all we can do to ensure that our city streets are healthy and protected. It is clear that we need to continue the conversation on the health and maintenance of our city's trees. And I hope that NYC Parks <clears throat> will continue this dialogue with myself and my colleagues as there are still many outstanding questions and concerns. Thank you again to NYC Parks and all who testified today. And thank you to my committee staff for their work on preparing for today's hearing and everyone behind the scenes. So this public hearing is being adjourned. Ending live.